Hello, and welcome to this installment of the Future Grind podcast. I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and today I'll be speaking with Natasha Vita Moore. Natasha has done a lot. She's an artist, designer, author, and speaker. She's the co-editor of The Transhumanist Reader and is the author of the brand new book, Transhumanism, What Is It? In 2015, she served as the lead scientist on published research into the memory retention of C. elegans nematodes after cryopreservation, which could have important implications for cryonics. Natasha currently serves as a professor at the University of Advancing Technology, as well as the executive director of Humanity Plus, a nonprofit organization which advocates for the ethical use of emerging technologies to improve human capabilities, and one which I am also involved with. We discussed Natasha's background and her path to transhumanist philosophy, her concept for a whole body prosthetic, the future of Humanity Plus, and more. As always, show notes and links are available at futuregrind.org. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever podcasts are found. A video version of this episode is posted on Facebook and YouTube. Make sure to subscribe on all of these platforms, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. If you'd like to keep this podcast running, you can donate at futuregrind.org forward slash support. Because of you, this is Future Grind. Right, and now we are here with Natasha. Natasha, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So your new book is titled Transhumanism, What Is It? And I think that's a great place to start this conversation. Your book explains this in more detail, but just so we're on the same page when we use that word in this conversation, what is transhumanism? Transhumanism is a worldview, a philosophy, and a practice. As a worldview, it encompasses multiple uh, different subsets of cultural systems, whether they be governance or business, uh, technology and science, ethics, philosophy, politics, etc., religion. The fundamental aspect of it is that it is looking at improving upon the human condition. So then the next question would be, what is the human condition? The human condition is the way in which we live our lives dictated by certain structures. For example, our biological body is dictated by our genetic makeup and a limited lifespan or what I call a shelf life. So as a worldview, it has to be diverse because as a world, there are many different subcultures in it, key cultures and subcultures. And if we didn't allow for diversity and multiplicity, then it would be a rigid and dogma would ensue. So we really focus on the culture as encompassing and engaging rather than separating. As a practice, transhumanism is a way of living one's life. It's rational optimism or practical optimism, ageless thinking, positive attitude, a can-do spirit, critical analysis, innovation, uh, entrepreneurial practices in looking at one's life as a project in and of itself to stay healthy and alive and prospering. As a philosophy, it's situated uh, strongly in an academic sector there and would be uh, looked at as a collection of other philosophies. For example, the philosophy of extropy would be within the transhumanist philosophies. So one can have a type of philosophy that fits into the the umbrella of transhumanism if indeed it holds the same values, tenets of uh, looking at improving upon the human condition. You've been involved in so many different fields, the arts, academia, nonprofits, and more. So you have a very cross-disciplinary perspective, which I think is valuable. But what is your background and how did you first find out about the concept of transhumanism? Uh, Excellent question. Thank you for asking me because it takes me down memory lane and I don't spend enough time, you know, reflecting on the past. And I think it's very healthy to do that. So thank you so much for this question. Um, I went to university in Memphis, Tennessee, 
where I went to high school, but I was born in New York. So people say, why did you move to Memphis? Well, it was great. I really loved having a bit of that social background of, you know, behind the Magnolia Curtain, that the elegance of the society of the South and evening gowns and parties and all of that. So that was great. However, it wasn't great in that when I graduated from high school, Martin Luther King was assassinated my senior year. So I went through the schism and the separation of, quote unquote, the haves and the have nots directly and specifically. So I know it heartfelt, um, true to true. I studied at the university there and I'm glad I did because I really enjoyed it. Um, It was a great art department. I was in fine arts. I studied painting and lithography, as well as performance art. And I got a degree uh, in, you know, fine arts, Bachelor of Fine Arts. And my thesis was based on Navajo mysticism and religion interpreted in the fine arts. (laughs) Kind of came at left field, but I've always been very spiritual. And I wanted to understand another type of people that were separate from my background and, you know, upbringing, which you know, was intellectual and highly creative with my family and whatnot. So I went and lived with the Navajo Indians, and um, I was inspired by the, the the beauty of that culture. From there, I became a commercial artist, started a, uh, a firm in Telluride, Colorado. And I didn't have to study that at all because my father was an art director in New York City, and we transferred to uh, Memphis and Hollywood, but I had a strong background in it growing up, so I, I knew it very well. That afforded me financial security because being an artist, a fine artist, there's you know there's no rhyme or reason to to doing that today other than to enjoy life. There there is very little financial reward, and if you're a transhumanist, you know that things can be costly, and you have to use your wits to determine how to you know, secure your position in um, life extension, for example. So I I didn't go back to school for quite some time. I lived in Telluride. Um, There was a big film festival there. So I became involved in film and I really fell in love with it. And it was a natural progression because most painters eventually become filmmakers. And it's kind of interesting. And I think the, the reasoning there is, that we want to see the paint strokes on the canvas move, come alive. And so I studied independent filmmaking at the University of uh, Colorado in Boulder, and I was mentored by Stan Brackage, um, probably one of the most recognized independent filmmakers back in the 1970s. And that was quite wonderful. So I made short films, and then I got into video. I moved to Los Angeles, and I worked out of a video lab, the first one in Los Angeles, and it was run by the librarian of the Motion Picture Academy. And um, he was a writer and wanted to create a venue for for artists, basically, to make videos. So I made a number of videos out of that facility. It was called Easy TV, and it was located on Hollywood Boulevard in Hollywood, and then it moved to Santa Monica, where it currently still exists. And um, one uh, video I made is called Two Women in B&W, translated as Two Women in Black and White. So I wanted to show a distinction in identity in black and white between a conversation between two women repeating the same lines over and over. And each time they repeated the lines, they changed, switched who's the dominant voice. It was very interesting. So it got uh, top billing at Women in Video, which was great. And I made another video with a colleague, and that was T minus and counting, which is space terminology. And that was uh, shown at the United States Environmental Film Festival. So I was proud of that. From there, I just continued performing. I did a lot of performance art, worked at Zoetrope and 20th Century Fox, co-ran a nightclub on Sunset Strip. And uh, it was it was great. I wrote for The Hollywood Reporter on films, and I traveled a lot performing. and. What occurred was in 1980, I was living in Japan and performing there and um, a height of my career and I got very ill and I realized the vulnerability of the human body and uh, I survived that illness. Um, And after I survived, I studied yoga for three years, three and a half years actually, uh, 
at Bikram's. If anyone knows hot yoga, that's <laughs> I was there every day for three and a half years with Bikram doing hot yoga. It's really tough, but it's I was an athlete of it, I suppose. I took it very seriously. And I also started realizing that I wasn't even paying awareness to the vulnerability of my body and the fact that I was dying and I didn't know it until, you know, I survived it. Thank goodness, a woman who found me a hemorrhaging to death and called an ambulance and bless her heart. You know, I'm alive because of her and I have to pay that forward. And so in the 1980s, I met FM Esfandiari, who was teaching courses at UCLA on the transhuman. And he started writing about the transhuman in 1972. And he has the chapter in a book called Woman, the Year 2000. He wrote the last chapter on the transhuman. And um, the editor of that book is uh, Maggie Tripp. And you can find it in the library, uh, probably online. I'm looking at it in my bookcase now. But that inspired me so much. And so I asked him if I could interview him. And I finally did many years later, but I didn't for a long, long time because I was so intrigued by the the idea of a living indefinitely and the idea of, you know, alternative bodies and what if we could repair the spine. So it was it was FM Sfondiari that inspired me. And I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto in 1992. And that got on board the Cassini-Huggins spacecraft. So the writing has gone out to space past Saturn saying, we are transhumans, etc. I continued studying. And then I created a TV show in Los Angeles called Transcentury Update and Transhuman Update, to kind of a slash between the two phrases. And I interviewed people about the future. So I offered knowledge to the, the general public through cable TV. And I also was able to learn. So I was self-educating. Rather than self-medicating, I was self-educating. And I fell in love with thinking about technology and science and the possibilities of the future. So that's the start. So just quickly to finish up, you know, responding to your question. From there, I just studied and studied and studied. And I realized I needed a whole new vocabulary that I was still speaking in the phraseology and the terminology of the fine arts. And I was dealing with technologists and scientists and entrepreneurs and inventors and innovators and philosophers and mathematicians and bioethicists and whatnot. And I didn't have the vocabulary to express what I was thinking. So I thought I have to go back to school. So I went back and I got a master's of science in future studies, systems analysis, systems thinking, uh, strategic planning, forecasting, the whole futurist toolkit. And I loved it. I had the best time. It was the hardest degree I've ever gotten but it was great. And then I quickly, after that, got a second master's while still working on the first master's. I got a master's in philosophy of technology. And then I went right into my PhD and I got my doctorate in England. And so my uh, master's of science and future studies was from the University of Houston in their technology department. And it's an excellent program. It is the best in the world if you want to study the future. And my second master's of science and PhD from the University of Plymouth in England. You mentioned there that your introduction to transhumanism came through F.M. Esfandiari, the noted futurist philosopher and Olympic basketball player that became known as F.M. 2030. But you soon began making your own contributions to transhumanism. In the early 1990s, you developed the concept of the primo posthuman. Yes. A whole body prosthetic, which is essentially a customizable structure that could replace the form and function of the human body. What led to the primo posthuman and what went into that design? Primo posthuman is a concept I developed from observation. I'll give you three stages of my life that led up to it. Stage one, I was 11 years old. I felt something funny in my mouth and I showed it to my brother, my older brother. And he said, mom, mom, come look. And my mother looked at my mouth, said, there's something funny there. There's a bump, a, um, a growth in your mouth. So we went to my doctor who sent me immediately to Chicago to a plastic surgeon and I had it removed. It was a tumor growing in my jaw and it was eating up my jaw by a facial bone structure. And it was the fastest growing tumor in a white child, which is kind of strange. So I made the history books on that. Um, but I was 11 years old, so I hadn't reached 
maturity or puberty, let's call it. And so my, my bones were still growing, thank goodness. So I had most of my jaw on the right side of my face removed and it did grow back. I have all false teeth on, on that side of my face and I have a hole, but it's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, but what's interesting is when I was in my plastic surgeon's office in Chicago, I saw people with deformities, much worse than what I had suffered. People who uh, maybe lost half the side of their face or um, their nose was gone. And, and this doctor uh, treated them and helped, you know, uh, at that stage, you know, prosthetics were really poor, at least structure, but they were doing the best they could at that time, whereas today prosthetics are incredible. So I got my first experience with prosthetics, not my own. I didn't need one. I was young enough where my bone structure grew back, but for other people. Okay. Number two, when I was in high school, this is at 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, I volunteered with my sorority for uh, to help people. And I've always done this. I've always volunteered in hospitals and I was a librarian in one hospital as a candy striper and um, just worked in other hospitals, just helping out when I had free time. Through um, one organization I worked uh, for, this is in Memphis, it was called the Home for Incurables. And these people were so malformed that they weren't allowed out in public, which is today would never be allowed. You know, it would be um, unethical to even have that name for an institution. And it would be considered, you know, uh, abusive behavior for anyone to be locked up because they didn't look, you know, like the norm of society. But in any case, I volunteered there and it showed me again, people that were struggling with their, their bodies and were diseased. And at the third section, the third chapter of this narrative is with FM Sfandiari in the 1980s, walking along Palisades Park in Santa Monica. We used to take long walks. And there was one young woman, I guess she was about 15, I guess. And she had to use a walker and she dragged her legs as if she had polio. And I thought, why can't we give her new legs? Why can't she have a different body? So it wasn't until I learned about the concept of the transhuman. And in the 1990s, when I was more sophisticated in the terminology of technology and science and, and all sorts of possibilities with the emerging and speculative technologies, that I conjectured what if we could have an alternative body? So this hypothesis was based on my knowledge, being an insider in the transhumanist world of, you know, mostly the XRP Institute and all the scholars from Silicon Valley and the heady encryption folks, technologists and all the brilliant minds there. And, and talking with them, it opened up a whole world for me creatively of, oh, so there's nanotechnology. And from that comes nanomedicine. That was Eric Drexler, who, you know, we call the father of nanotechnology. Uh, he was part of that group that I was with in, you know, Silicon Valley in Los Angeles. And then Hans Moravec, the roboticist who talked about pigs in cyberspace, um, very renowned um, about in the world of uploading. He would talk to me about, well, you know, what if the mind could go here and there and, you know, different bodies? And then, of course, there was Ralph Merkel nanotechnology and Robert Friedis with nanomedicine and then engineering many of the scholars of artificial intelligence like Ben Gertzel and Peter Voss. And, you know, the list goes on of this astounding nexus of brilliant minds that I had access to. And so I started asking questions and uh, I just you know put it out there. What if we had an alternative body and Ralph Merkel or Drexler or Minsky would say, hey, that's a great idea. So what I did is I built a team because I knew I wasn't an expert in these areas. I had the vision. I just needed a team of experts to work with. So I wrote a proposal and I sent it to some of the leading minds that I knew, many of those that I just mentioned. And I said, here's a project I'm working on. I want to design a future body and I need to make sure I'm on the right path. So would you be on my advisory council? And everyone said that I asked said yes. And um, I started drawing it out. At first, I was a little bit nervous about it. I was a little bit tongue in cheek. So I turned it into an animation, like a car ad. So it was a vehicle future body design that took you here and there. So I, I formed an analogy with the body. It's a transport system or a transportation device. And then I used my own body. 
And so I've always used my own body and all my work, uh, you know, ever since I was a fine artist. And I had, you know, photographs and I would work on them in Photoshop and Pixar and, you know, different you know, 3D rendering. And then it started crystallizing. Before I knew it, I had moved from the tongue in cheek ad about a future body, you know, uh, with a warranty on it. If you don't treat it well and, and you know, take care of it, you lose a warranty. <laughs> so I had many very fun and, and you know, clever uh, comments to it. And then I got serious. And then I realized it was a good idea. So then I, I built it out, again, using my own body and also using Pixar uh, 3D modeling. And I don't know how it happened, but all of a sudden it started becoming publicized. And I can't remember who first wrote about it, but it hit magazines, newspapers, TV shows across the planet. I mean, I'm in my, uh, my study now. I'm looking at newspapers and magazines in Italy and Brazil and Germany and the Netherlands and S Sweden and Australia and Japan and China, South Korea, Austria. I mean, all around the world, people were interested in this idea and it was covered. So it really was a concept that proved to be highly successful and it put my name on the map. Now, did I make money from it? No. I wasn't an entrepreneur. I'm not. I, I, I someone else would have, but I didn't. So your Primo Posthuman is a design concept, and it largely exists as drawings and models. But has there been any effort to actually create an early physical version of something like the Primo Posthuman? No, because it was a it was an idea before its time. In the 1990s, prosthetics were still. Mm -mm. And early on, so at the time I designed Primo Posthuman, it was a theoretical concept that was designed out as a prototype. So I drew it out, I you know 3D rendered it. So I have everything documented um, on my old website. I had it where you could click on different parts of the body, and it would go to that part of the body to say what technology would replace that organ or the skin or the ligaments or whatever and who the thought leaders are in that area and how it would come about. So I did my research and I did a tremendous amount of due diligence so that my research was solid and it would be taken seriously. The only problem was at that time, there was uh, prosthetics and robotics and haptic systems were not connected. They didn't connect till later on. So today you have a prosthetic arm that can feel the heat of a cup of coffee or tea or the coolness of a nice cold beer, something like that. But at that time, we didn't have that connection through haptic systems between a prosthetic device that uh, could function as well as they do today. In an article from a 2000 issue of Wired magazine, you're quoted as saying, our bodies will be the next fashion statement. We will design them in all sorts of interesting combinations of texture, colors, tones, and luminosity. I think that this idea is one of those that might scare some people. Things like tattoos, piercings, and colored hair were long rejected by much of society, and there is still some stigma associated with these things. More extreme body modifications are still rejected. How do you suggest we overcome this conservatism and make your vision a reality sooner rather than later? My thought on that is that there needs to be um, several approaches. When talking to the mainstream about ideas that may ruffle their feathers, it's wise to use mimetic engineering, a sense of inclusivity, and a smile. And basically, people are less threatened by something that would otherwise be outrageous to them if you have a welcoming attitude and you don't lecture at people. So you would invite people uh, on the creative side of, hey, wouldn't this be cool if we had this? And then you're stimulating their, their creative muscle. And you know people kind of like that in a way. If I approach uh, the discussion from the perspective of an academic as you know, a lecturing, then that, that doesn't go over very well. I've learned that. <laughs> people in audiences yelling at me, you hate your body. And I go, no, I don't. I'm a bodybuilder. I love my body. I, you know, I go to the gym. I'm very, you know, happy with it. I just want it to last a little bit longer and to maybe slow down aging. 
So people get used to it, hair color. I mean, I remember the first time uh, I saw a woman with pink hair or blue hair and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And people kind of used to sneer or, you know, kind of give a look, especially with people with, you know, tattoos and piercings. And now we kind of accept it. And you're right, Ryan, it's, you know, the piercing, the hair color, the tattoos at first were a little bit daunting to the mainstream, but now people kind of accept it. They may not like it, but they accept it. I think that's a paradigmatic shift in society in the United States. I don't know how it is other areas of the world, but especially in the United States, we've had to learn to accept each other. For example, my niece is Pentecostal now, and she is not offended by my lifestyle. And she just does her thing. And I have a very Christian Episcopalian family and they all love me and they hang out with me. And we talk about these things. It's not their thing, but, you know, they value they value me and they value the fact that I've been doing this for years and I even teach it. So there at first it was like, uh oh, <laughs> but now it's not more largely to answer your question. We are going to see a very strong need for transhumanism to spread. And the only way we can do that uh, successfully is to be better entrepreneurs, to be better leaders, and to be more accepting of people who don't accept us. One of the most all-encompassing books on the topic of transhumanism is one that you compiled and edited. You released The Transhumanist Reader, Classical and Contemporary Essays on the Science, Technology, and Philosophy of the Human Future in 2013. And this includes essays from some big names. Just to list a few, you have Nick Bostrom, Anders Sandberg, Ben Goetzel, Martin Rothblatt, Marvin Minsky, Aubrey de Grey, Werner Vinge, Ray Kurzweil, and many more. How did this project come about, and how did you get all of these people on board? Oh, thank you for asking this. I'm really proud of that book. I think it's a really good intro. Maybe a little bit academic, but we had an ap- academic publisher, but anyone can read it. Okay, so... I guess, no, to be honest, I got tired of people misconstruing what the transhumanist concept is. And I remember, gosh, getting so much bad press in the 1990s. Oh, gosh, it was it was horrifying. I mean, and then I remember reading an article in an academic journal by postmodernists like N. Catherine Hales and Don Ide and Andrew Pickering, um, who pretty much came out of the the French postmodernist agenda and philosophy of uh, Bouillard and Lacan, Foucault and that sector. And they did not understand technology. And so they wrote about transhumanism or transhumanist thinking as We hated our bodies. We just wanted to be uploaded into machines. We wanted to be immortal and leave humans behind. And it was just ridiculous science fiction nonsense. And I went, what? Oh, and they were all libertarians. I went, I I was elected to the Green Party. Come on. And I wrote to the um, managing editor of that academic journal. And I said, very politely, "Um, I'm concerned here. Um, None of these academics called me and I checked the community and no one was called or asked about any of this. So they're just making this up. I said, that's an effrontery. And as academics, they should know better. Uh, They didn't do their research. Uh, Their arguments are exceedingly weak. And so I had a wonderful conversation with the managing editor that was called the Meta Nexus Journal. And so he said, well, I'd like to invite you to be the next guest editor. Why don't you pull some authors together and respond to the arguments placed at your door, defaming you? And I said, great, we're on. So I called up a number of my colleagues and we responded. And many of those are in the book. Many of the responses are in the book of the Transhumanist Reader. And it was great. So that ended up becoming a book. And you can see it at Amazon. It's called Transhumanism and Its Critics. And you can see the arguments on both sides. Unfortunately, they were given the last, you know, (laughs) after we responded to their hyperbole and miscalculations and misconstruing of of facts, they were allowed to respond back. But only, I think, a few did. But it was good. And then N. Catherine Hales, who's so renowned, said something like, I thought transhumanism would would be gone, but it, it is truly here to stay. So I liked that. I thought that was good. That was the primer. 
the fact that so much misinformation, not just in the media, in the press by a yellow dog journalism, but in academics where you're supposed to have logic and reason and facts. And if you're if you're uh, writing about a philosophy or a worldview, at least get it correct, for goodness sakes. So that was my passion for uh, coming up with this idea. And I spoke to Max Moore and we agreed to work on it together. And every author in the book is someone I would say is a colleague, a dear friend, a brother, a sister, you know, our extended family. And I respect every single author in that book enormously. And I'm very pleased that they wrote such incredible essays to be included. You've also explored a concept that you refer to as life expansion. Let's talk about that more. What is life expansion? Life expansion is an addition or an augmentation or amendment to life extension. Life extension refers to the biological body, reversing aging and extending the limited lifespan of 122 years or so. Life expansion means to expand life onto other substrates other than exclusively biological substrate. So the other substrates would be for example, into virtual reality or into augmented reality, into a virtual game, into the metaverse, into computational system, into artificial environments and environments that we haven't yet realized. So by that, it frees life or existence from being sequestered to strictly biology and offers instead the opportunity to address looking at expanding uh, through other modalities or substrates. In 2018, you were named as the executive director of Humanity Plus, a nonprofit organization that promotes the ethical use of new technologies to improve human capabilities. Some in my audience might be familiar with it from its previous name, the World Transhumanist Association, which was founded by Nick Bostrom and David Pierce in 1998. But it has gone through some changes since then, what are the current initiatives of Humanity Plus, and what do you hope to accomplish with it? The current initiatives of, of Humanity Plus are education, innovation, and looking at how we can work with others to spread the ideas through governance. And the impetus behind this is pretty much the same impetus behind the Transhumanist Reader or my TV show that I had on cable TV in Los Angeles. There's conflicting information out there and people don't know where to go to get the correct information. Well, if our politicians, if our governing bodies doesn't understand what's happening with emerging and exponential technology, including existential risk, we're in trouble. They need to learn. So uh, Humanity Plus aims on reaching out more towards the the governance uh, sector in various countries where, where people live that are interested in politics. The reason Humanity Plus rebranded itself from World Transhumanist Association to Humanity Plus is because of politics. The World Transhumanist Association had become too politicized and polarized to support anti-right-wing and staunch left-wing. And that's okay for anyone to have, have those beliefs. But I think it's wrong to do that. People need to have their own particular political and religious views and still be transhumanist. You know, no one says this is right and this is wrong. Who the heck are you to say that? You know, wh- who made you, you know, the lord of the manor? So World Transhumanist Association started getting some backlash from that. Its leaders were just pushing too hard in that area. And there was a lot of conflict. So the board changed, people changed, and they rebranded it. And a lot of Effort was spent in rebanding WTA to Humanity Plus, and they did an excellent job at it. And Humanity Plus, I think, has has really done a great job at, at re-interfacing with not only the culture of transhumanists, but also the broader culture and taking a look at what the intellectual merits are of transhumanist thinking and what the broader impacts are. And that's where it, it's very important. So right now we're working on a number of different things. Since I became executive director, I was chair for about four years before executive director, and I decided I, I really need to roll up my shirt sleeves and, and you know get in the trenches and do some hard work. 
And the first thing I did was we worked all of our legal stuff. So I've spent the past year working diligently on making sure all of our bylaws, our articles of incorporation, the governing structure of the organization is, is legal. We're in good with the Secretary of State, the federal government, all that. But along with that, getting donations and something that I've been working on with Ben Gertzel, getting donations to fund for example, Girls Coding Day in Africa and looking at AI researchers in China and at Harvard and different places and helping them with the research by providing financial support. And I think that's really important. Another thing I've, I've been working on since my role as executive director is to create the H plus prize. And we got a, a wonderful donation by one of our members, totally thankful to him. And he had the idea of doing a blockchain prize. And so we created our first prize, the H plus prize, which the mutual benefits between blockchain and transhumanism. And we gave out three $1,000 awards and one $5,000 award for the top paper. And uh, so that was great. Right now we're working on our next prize, which is going to be an innovation prize. And so we're going to be hammering that out in the board meeting next month. So I'm very excited about that. Another project I'm working on is building a repository of leaders in the sciences, technology, philosophy, entrepreneurs, innovators, and educators, et cetera, and having it available on our website so that, for example, if you want to know about Andrew Sandberg, well, Andrew Sandberg is a neuroscientist. He's at the Oxford University Future of Humanity Institute. He's a polymath. He's an you know, incredibly awesome human being. So he is one of our leaders. He's an advisor to Humanity Plus. And so we want to promote the people that have worked hard for many years and the, the new people to the community, such as yourself, that are contributing enormously through your, your awareness, your own knowledge, your talent and your skills. So it'll have people from Max Moore to Mick Bostrom to, of course, a number of women, Christine Peterson, who is not necessarily a transhumanist, but through the Foresight Institute and the Voice and Exit Conference in Austin has made incredible contributions to our growing larger community. Other than that, we just did two conferences in 2018, one in China on artificial intelligence and robotics and one in Madrid, Spain on life extension and Sophia the robot was there, which was great. And we're gonna look at what we're doing in 2018, probably going to have an online conference. And in 2020, we're, we hope to have a very large festival conference in Los Angeles. If someone wants to get involved with Humanity Plus, how can they do that? Oh, I would love your audience to become members. Oh, yes, I mean, your audience is, is incredible and wow collaborated some wonderful ideas. Okay, so go to the website, Humanity Plus, that's H-U-M-A-N-I-T-Y-P-L-U-S dot org. And then it'll say join. Click there and join. It's only $4 and I think 99 cents a month or $60 a year. You know, you spend $60 on a dinner. Um, help participate and join us in educating the public about necessary information and ideas through that. Also, you can email info at humanityplus.org or find me. I will put links to those resources in the show notes at futuregrind.org, so anyone who would like to join can head there to find out more. So many people likely already know that you are married to Max Moore, a noted transhumanist philosopher and the CEO of the Alcor Life Extension Foundation a nonprofit which is focused on cryonics. And you have an interest in cryonics yourself, but I feel that there are a lot of misconceptions about this practice, so I'd love to hear from you what cryonics is and what its goals are. Cryonics is a suspension process. It's not freezing. The human is not frozen. It's vitrified, meaning it's taken to a temperature in liquid nitrogen where it is suspended. And that's a surgical procedure. They have neuroscientists and neurosurgeons who work with them and all sorts of uh, incredible surgeons who do the process. So I, I can't talk about that because I'm not an expert in that area, but basically cryonics is where you are suspended in liquid nitrogen and held in that state. Your body is held in that state until 
uh, nanomedicine catches up, develop the methods, the means to revive a person, to bring a person back to um, existence. So you're suspended. However, to be put into cryonics, you have to be pronounced dead, meaning, and this is the, this is a very interesting point, meaning that medical science says you're dead. But we know from history that medical science has changed what it means to be dead over the eons. In the past, when someone stopped breathing or was in a coma, we thought they were dead. We buried them. When someone's heart stopped, we thought they were dead. We buried them. Today, we're learning that you can bring a person back to life by using machines put to the heart to revive the person, right? We see this every day. This is done. This is normal, everyday practice. The person's dead. You put the fibrillator, you get the electricity going, and you recharge the heart. Normal process. Today, when someone is dead, we put um, them up to a machine to keep their heart going. Uh, people can be left on life support systems for a very long time with a hope that that medical technology will advance to bringing the person back. So that's accepted. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, well, we're going to have to pull the plug. We can't wait any longer. Well, that's their choice. However, there are people and many people who do think that medical um, technology will advance to a state where those who are pronounced dead today, 10 years from now, five years from now, maybe even next year, there will be a cure for that disease. And we see this happening all the time, almost on a monthly, not a yearly basis, but almost on a, a monthly basis, we're seeing advances in cures and medications to help people. So that's what Cranix is. It's a, it's a choice not to be buried. It's a choice to be suspended, put in that suspended state, waiting for technology, medical technology to catch up. And this practice is quite controversial. Many respected scientists don't believe that it will ever be possible to bring back these preserved patients or bodies or whatever you'd like to call them. But there is some interesting scientific research out there which shows promise for these techniques. And some of this research was conducted by you. In 2015, you published research on C. elegans nematodes after cryopreservation in the Rejuvenation Research Journal. What can you tell us about this work? My research on the C. elegans was to prove that long-term memory exists after cryopreservation. So I worked with hundreds of nematodes. There are C. elegans. They're the first a small animal to have its whole genome sequenced. And it's a very famous worm in the scientific community. It's favored and it's a beautiful creature, beautiful. So I worked with the nematodes, the C. elegans, and I trained them to um, find food based on olfactory imprinting where I put a chemical near the food when they were babies, when they were first born. So they grew up identifying their food in the Petri dish near where I put a, just a dab of a, a chemical. So because they are very sensitive to smell, they identified smell with their food. Okay. So then when the small animals became mature, I vitrified them using the cryotop method, which is used for embryos. So I worked with hundreds of worms, uh, these nematodes, and I tested them after vitrifying or after putting in cryonics, let's say, uh, tested them to see if they would remember to find food where the chemical was. So I did a lot of experiments in the Petri dish with these tiny microscopic animals, and they are small, they're simple animals, and tested them. And 90% went directly to the food where the chemical was. So it is published in Aubrey de Grey's scientific journal, which you mentioned. And um, you will see the experiments there and you can read about it. And my team member, Dr. Bronco from Seville, Spain, was an expert in cryotop freezing embryos. So I brought him over to the United States to work with me at Alcor. And we built our research lab there. And he was my lab technician and co-creator. I was the lead scientific researcher on this project. And we developed the, our methodology together through trial and error. And I wrote the paper. 
And um, he did most of the research himself because he was so skilled working with microscopic organisms where it was really hard for me. So he did most of the experiments under the microscope. For many, cryonics is a backup plan. Most people would prefer to extend their lives without cryopreservation. And I imagine that you are one of these people. So what are your strategies for longevity? Are there any diets, workouts, practices, or supplements that you use? Absolutely. I think the most one is to move. Keep moving. In fact, right before our podcast, I went to the gym. So I work out every day. I go to the park with my dog. And if it's not too cold, I jog. And I'm not a jogger because I think it's hard on the body, but I've developed a way that I can jog more like a ballerina, I guess. <laughs> it's more like a dance. So I do jog. And I jog um, usually every day a half mile and then I'll walk. I'll continue to walk. And that's so important. I also practice yoga. I do Pilates and I love to dance. So keeping moving, keep your muscles going. Lifting weights is incredibly important because it helps the uh, muscle uh, durability and, and bone strength. So that's really important um, as we age, our bones weaken. I take my vitamins every day a good multiple from a life extension foundation. And I started on hormone replacement therapy very early at 47. And I did that because I didn't want to go through perimenopause. And I thought that if I started early with hormone replacement therapy, which is basically bioidentical estradiol and um, prometrium, uh, you can use prometrium or progesterone, to counter it. If you just take the estrogen or the estradiol, the side effect could be breast cancer. So you have to balance it out with the complementary drug. The positive attitude, I think cognition is so important, mind over matter. You wake up happy, you believe in yourself, and you know, don't let other people get you down. And if you are depressed, practice, do practices to overcome that depression or sadness, or do take serotonin uptake inhibitors, very important. Try to create oxytocin through joy and lovemaking and, you know, sex is always great exercise, but dancing and sing and, you know, love life, get a puppy <laughs> or a cat, something. I think the brain is so important to keep agile. So the plasticity of the brain through new challenges, new experiences. But I think most importantly, besides all the exercise and you know, supplements and whatnot, is to try to spread love, you know, as as a daily process. A smile um, lights up the world. I don't have any major augmentations because I haven't needed them. If I did need them, I would have them. For example, I haven't needed any immunotherapy, but if I did need it for any reason, I would definitely have immunotherapy. You um, Sometimes if you go out of the country, uh, you can get it for less expensive. I haven't done any um, gene therapy because I haven't needed it, but if I did, I would do it. So for me, I think it's very important to do all the natural stuff to be as healthy within this, this time frame and in this environment that we live in, this biosphere, and to work with um, like you know, grass-fed beef, if you eat meat, slow down on the dairy and eat your greens. I, I you know, have greens every day, every day, you know, rich greens and try to cut down on the sugar, if not eliminated as much as possible. And I love a glass of wine, so that's a hard one. But, uh, um, you know, you, you can't, you know, be a Puritan. And I don't think taking lots of vitamins is a really good idea. They could conglomerate in your stomach and cause problems. But just go to the doctor and get your blood work done every year. And, you know, be mindful of your body. So we started this interview off mentioning your new book titled Transhumanism, What Is It?, as well as The Transhumanist Reader. We also discussed Humanity Plus and the resources available on their website. But for people who would like to find out more about you and your work, how can they do that? I think what I would love for your audience to do is just go to my website and see where I'm lecturing, watch my videos. And if you have any collaboration that you want to talk about or work on, you know, uh, ping me. And you can reach me through info at humanityplus.org or from my website. Great. And I will put links to your website 
as well as to all of the other people, initiatives, and resources we've mentioned in the show notes at futuregrind.org. Natasha, thanks again for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Excellent questions, and I admire you and your work. Keep it up. Hey, everyone. Ryan O'Shea again, and thank you for listening to my interview with Natasha. Remember to check out the show notes and more at futuregrind.org. Make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and you can also like, comment, and share to spread the word. We also need your help to keep this podcast running. Just go to futuregrind.org forward slash support. Till next time, this is Future Grind. Future Grind.